So my name's Ali Gumilia Baker and I am a mourning woman who's grown up on Ghana country in Adelaide and I also am a senior lecturer at Flinders University and I teach into Aboriginal history and cultural studies topics as well as um, uh, Aboriginal art and a bit of representation and cinema Um, and I'm also a practicing artist and I'm part of a collective of Aboriginal women artists called the Unbound Collective and um, we make kind of multimedia type work um, and a PhD yes uh, I have a PhD in Uh, creative writing and Australian studies and a master's in screen studies in filmmaking and an undergraduate honours degree in visual arts from yeah so you're very well placed then Ali to talk about such things as learning relearning unlearning yeah um I don't know if I'm I've certainly spent a lot of time thinking about those things. So um, I could probably say that I have thoughts about learning, relearning, unlearning, decolonising, deinstitutionalising. But I feel as though on my own, I I feel as though that's really a collective endeavour. And so therefore I'm... Whether I'm well placed or not is not really going to be the issue. It's how everyone responds to those ideas that I guess becomes the bigger philosophical problem that we have collectively to face. Yeah, but I I spent a lot of time, I guess, feeling quite intimidated when I first started at university. I remember kind of the internalised... body of knowledge that was given to me at school and the kind of way that I'd grown up in the 1980s in in the outer suburbs of Adelaide and Salisbury thinking about what culture was or what real intelligence or um, kind of intellectual discussion was was very white and male but it was more than that it was also placed outside of this country so the real universal ideas about what it means to be human or what it means to be um, a cultured being were coming we were told were coming from Europe so when I went to university growing up as I did around Aboriginal people and Aboriginal women in my family. In funny ways, I I was very, very... Like, I've grown up around really political people, really um, people who who understood that um, our identities were political things and that to not deny your history but to be proud and to challenge and to be critical of a history that has actively tried to kind of kill us off. But I hadn't really gotten my head around when I first went to university what that meant in in a university context, what that meant, what it meant to be political in relation to disciplines of knowledge. And I think In the 90s when I was studying art, what became really clear to me and what I understood from my learning and unlearning at that time was that there were no Aboriginal people and Aboriginal knowledges reflected back at me in that degree. There was none. I was never, ever taught by an Aboriginal person throughout my degree. I was never, even though it was about art, and at that time... Aboriginal art was starting to make a big mark internationally and nationally. We we weren't given 
Aboriginal people weren't placed as the authorities, as the experts on our own cultural practice. So there were white anthropologists in the School of Aboriginal Studies. Um, there were a few Aboriginal people working in at Underdale at that time at the University of South Australia, but um, certainly in the art school, not even a guest lecturer, you know, was a paid Aboriginal artist or person. So what that says to you without even saying anything is that the knowledge that Aboriginal communities that local Aboriginal communities and peoples have is not of relevance to this discipline of knowledge. And it says that through a, a silent kind of exclusion, basically. Um, and it says something very profound to the other students, in the non-Indigenous students doing the degree. It says that Aboriginal people don't have anything to offer to this field of knowledge and that um, we're not powerful. And I guess, you know, when I think about that place, and I feel the, the more I thought about it doing my honours, because I got more and more interested in, I guess, the whole, all of the blind spots that this country has in relation to Indigenous peoples and what the active war that's occurred against our bodies, our physical bodies in the landscape. And the fact that we were in a in a kind of a university on a piece of country next to Karawira Parry, next to the what we now know to be also called the River Torrens, and the history, the incredibly violent but also incredibly beautiful histories of that place were actively forgotten by most of the people who were teaching in that institution. So it was a deliberate thing. Well, I think it is a deliberate thing when you make it your business not to know mm -hmm. any of the local histories <clears throat> of a place. When you study everything else about the world, but you completely ignore what is in front of you and say... And all your knowledge comes from... Well, Europe. Or we could have been at an institution in Europe. Mm. And the only way you could become a famous artist was to leave. It was to leave Adelaide, that's for sure. Mm. You might go to Sydney, you might go to Melbourne. You certainly would go to Europe. And that's where you become an artist who's famous and then you come back here. And... So all of the good culture comes from far away. Mm. And it's a kind of internalised self-hatred that goes on. And it goes on. It's changed a bit. And I think it's changed because there's a different kind of, with the globalised kind of economies, there's a different kind of valuing of the local in hipster white society. So there's a different kind of, valuing of the not mass produced the local the handmade the slow the and the valuing of and and probably you, you know that's self-preserving in a way it's but they've kind of made that aesthetically pleasing so now all of a sudden it's it's kind of cool to know mm. your local histories mm. in a way that it's never been in this country so um Things have shifted in terms of the way the art scene might work, you know, as a reflection of a broader culture. But then I thought, and I remember sitting in the cafeteria at Underdale and when I first started, and I said, what if... I said to my mum, oh, you know, what if... Um, I'm not good enough. And she said, look around. She said, all of these people, you are one of the smartest people here. I want you to understand that. And I also want you to understand that um, that you don't have to f feel as though we 
if you're asked about being Aboriginal, I don't want you to ever feel ashamed of who you are because we have paid. Our family has paid. We have paid and paid and paid. So I want you to feel really proud of who we are in this space. I, I never, ever want you to be ashamed of that because as a people, we have suffered enormously. And I, and I feel, you know that ultimately that's been something that stayed with me as a kind of a um it's so when you start off in the field of kind of uh cultural thinking about having a voice and using that voice you have to know you have to have things to you have to find your voice you have to have the confidence to use your voice and then you have to have things to say and the things that you have to say have to have um, a truth to them that resonates, but also a meaning, you know, a meaning that's beyond, you know, it's collective. It's a collective understanding about um, what are the issues that we're facing. And, you know, that's been the gift of education for me. But it's also, um, it's kind of long-term uh struggle with the self you know sometimes it, you feel quite um like we could all we could all share in some understandings but we can't quite get there mm. <laughs> mm. it's just it's just a, it, it it's um if only people would understand this we could all <clears throat> be so much better off mm. com as communities as peoples and you know the planet is suffering mm. because of the problem with education and the problem with representation. Mm. So there's a lot of peoples who don't have opportunities for education, and but there's a lot of people who do, who despise, who, who don't see it as an important part of their, you know, their life want to kind of see see that they, they see it's too hard it's and but it's also they're a little bit anti-intellectual in terms of mm. so there's been a bit of fostering of that i think um, amongst some leaders of this country and amongst you know some so you, you kind of you're justifying your own position within your communities, but you're also justifying your own position within an institution that doesn't have any other Aboriginal people in the space. <laughs> or very few, yeah. So I feel as though that inspired me to become an academic. In some ways, the anger that that fueled in me, because I did feel, I feel, I felt angry at that, the um the misrepresentation mm -hmm. the mis miseducation of me the missed opportunities that I was a young person that I had all of these potentially amazing gifts to be giving at a young age but I didn't feel as though there was any place for me to um to even have an outlet like I didn't feel as though I was even seen and I think for, um, so recently I made this, this eight metre high single pile of uh, racist texts and I took it to Melbourne and I exhibited it in the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art and it goes just one line of books all the way up to the ceiling. And the way I describe those books to the, to the students that I, I'm working with I say well you know when I made this stack I was thinking about what it was like for my mother or her gen and other Aboriginal people of her generation and my aunties when they were growing up if they went to the library to look for themselves and they couldn't find any representation in any book that had something that represented their identities in the beautiful way that I understood them to be. And 
not only couldn't they find a book that represented them, but most of the books actively excluded them. So either you were described as the most disgusting being on the face of the planet, or you were completely erased from the national consciousness. So there was a terra nullius of Australia in the 1960s, a photographic book, no Aboriginal people present. It was just a white country. Or um, Australia, short stories, Australia, poetry, Australia, you know, you Australia, Australia you know, the bedside book of colonial doings or um, all of these books where you look at them and you go, this is creating a country and I'm not part of it. Mm. And it does something to your head, but it also creates an atmosphere of that place. It tells the story of a nation. It creates a narrative of nation that is so powerful that we're all under some kind of spell because of it. The films, all the Australian, the Australian films are all white. So when you, ex- when you create the terra nullius of representation, it does a weird thing to the people, the Aboriginal people who are living in that space. And so I think what's flipped for us is that I feel as though, and there's a lot of Aboriginal people who are, you know, and we've got, I've got artists to look to as role models and political leaders who've worked, you know, of my mother's generation and my grandmother's generation who've been working for a long time. And so now I don't feel as though we have to continue to have the same conversations, even though I do in my Aboriginal history classes. I have the same conversations. People don't know. People haven't heard that history. People have grown, how could I have grown up and not know this? How could I not know about the history of social Darwinism in this country? How, how did I not know about the segregation policies, the assimilation policies, the consorting laws? How did I not know about the dog tags and the, and the fact that Aboriginal people weren't even allowed to live in the cities and towns. How did I not see that that was the world that I was in? How did I not see the deep racism that's embedded in every law and institution of this country? Because you're 17 and you've grown up and you haven't had any contact with Aboriginal people and you haven't been taught it in school and your families don't know it. So there's a whole lot of issues around education and the representation of those ideas because there's not an ownership of that genocidal history. And so it ripples down. But for other Aboriginal people that I know who are talking about different things, we don't always have to have that conversation. We can flip it we can flip the whole conversation and say, no, I don't want to have the conversation on your terms anymore. You're not designing the questions. I'll tell you what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about these ideas. And so it's that ability to be able to, I don't need to explain my identity. I don't need to justify my identity to someone just because they wake up in the morning and they they want to know about me all of a sudden. That's not... I'm not here for them, you know. And, you know, I think about um, Rosalie Kunoth Monks on Q&A saying, I am not the problem. I am sovereign. I am not the problem. I did not come, you know, I'm not here for your, for your entertainment. I'm not your pet. I'm not your project, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, in fact, I'm a sovereign person. I think that those conversations are really empowering for Aboriginal people to say, no, like, Okay, the world might not understand who we are, but we do. And sometimes we share, you know. And part of my job is to really create a space where it's where people start to tease out some of those fears and understand themselves in relation to their own histories. And so that work becomes it's emotionally draining. It can be creative. It's very rewarding when people 
have some amazing epiphany and when they drop some of the the racism that they never knew that they had internalized when they start to understand the impact of of hierarchies of race on how they've perceived what culture is or what um what's valued what's considered valuable you know is that unlearning i think that that is it's unlearning something about yourself by learning something else Mm. but you can't force someone to do that and you can't force someone to care but what we require is a deep moral transformation not only in our communities but globally of people who hold power because anything less than that is pro forma it's it's the doing but not the feeling it's you know it's it's superficial and the world needs deeply soulful love and care and change in ways that are yet to be we can imagine but we can't always describe you know but the planet will turn away from us if we don't if we don't if we don't come to those understandings and that that will you know in terms of justice and the possibility for you know hopeful cultural renewal and reproduction of love and humanity then that's what you hope for when you do when you do engage in that teaching you know you want to be creating places that you want your children to be able to live in and I think those two things are inextricably linked we can't have this regenerative future until we've owned yeah there's lots of Aboriginal people who would say that the history is past present future it is definitely the present so it's how we understand our relationship to this thing we call the past but it's actually about what we are doing in the moment, in the present. Mm. Because we are all, you know, I remember reading this beautiful quote from um, Claudia Rankin, who wrote a book called Citizen, an American Lyric. And it's really talking about kind of race politics in America at the moment. She says, you know, the world is wrong. You can't put history behind you. You are its cupboard. Everything is buried in you. We are all, in fact, completely a product of this time before. And how much of that we can actually cope with bringing into the present is really also about how much we can imagine futures that aren't apocalyptic. You know, we have to be able to imagine futures Uh, Donna Haraway writes about it um, as being in the thick present. So really how we manage to live in the thick present Mm. without projecting ourselves into the future or into the past is actually the kind of process of learning how to not be capitulating between, you know, but actually being in the present, which is as much about the future and the past as it can be. Because we're only ever here. We're only ever going to be in the present. But we have to have that understanding of how we fit in this, you know, what Alexander Wahili might describe as a racialized assemblage or, you know, there's, there's this kind of idea of entanglements mm. that Karen Barad talks about which she talks about in relation to quantum physics. She says we, we can change, we can't erase the past, but we can change it. And that's through our understanding of it. We can, we can change our relationship to it. Our relationship to it. Yeah, but she also says that you can demonstrate that through quantum physics. So it's quite a profound lifting, like a a really a connection between quantum physics and cultural studies as discipline. So this is a kind of cheese-like cutting-edge thinker 
in what now is described as the post-humanity. So it's this idea of post-human. But for me, because she's a non-Indigenous academic, but for me what's really profound in that is that Aboriginal people have always seen the world in these ways, that it's magical and it's scientific and it's, it's big, big, huge stories that resonate particular truths through time. And some of those truths stand, stand the test of time. They're very, very strong sets of ideas that you can live by. But it's also about, mag- it's a magical mm. world of fantastical stories of huge, beyond, beyond your understanding. It's things that you can't possibly ever know, but you can catch a glimmer of them mm. and it helps you survive. And how poor is your life if you never even get a glimmer? Yeah, that's right. Mm. Well, it's it's kind of beyond the, um, this idea of humanity and this idea of what is a life. And I guess it's also about this idea of what is this idea of freedom that I think people need to interrogate. Mm. Because I think that this idea of freedom, of the, the whiteness allows that you could know anything you could travel anywhere the world's your oyster yeah i think that that's misguided Mm. no one can ever escape suffering and and also we're not all going to be able to achieve and nor should we want to know everything it's it's an impossibility but it's also something that you shouldn't even strive to do Mm. some things are unknowable and we should accept the unknowability, Mm. but more than accept it, honour it. Because Because some are really irrelevant. Mm. There's things that are important. You know, there's not an equal... It's not levelled out here of knowledge. Some knowledges are really important Mm. and some knowledges are just not. And people need to choose what they're thinking about really carefully because... We can cast any kinds of spells over ourselves and over the the world of want and greed and all sorts of things, but it's actually not benefiting anyone. And also really thinking about sentient life other than our own. Mm. So the trees, like really, really old trees or, or, or animals and the kind of the planet, the rest of the planet, human life above all else is is also a really dangerous trajectory you know like I don't know what success is but I do know that it's it's doomed for deep unhappiness Mm. it's going against all of the incredible gifts that we have completely it's doomed for suffering and there's a sense of belonging too that you don't get when you have this view of everything is yours to take it's you can't belong to anything when, no. you, when you're just taking. And there's a real arrogant perception associated with it mm. that also is about this sense, this sense of yourself where I used to think about it a lot. You know, when you speak, um, you take up space, and and sometimes it it means that other quieter voices can't be heard. So, and when you travel, you displace a whole lot of things mm. in the in the actual physical process of traveling. And you might not know anything about where you're going, but for me, when you arrive in a place, you know, for Nungas, there's that real sense of the spirits of country. So I always feel almost like a child, like a toddler or something when I arrive in a new place. If I haven't if I don't understand where I am, so I don't know the old stories of that place, I don't know any of the elders or haven't met them yet, and I haven't connected with people who've thought deeply about what that country is, I I would never assume that I could make decisions about a place in that way. Like, I wouldn't go somewhere and think, oh, I can just rule the roost here. 
There's lots of Aboriginal people who would say that the history is past, present, future. It is definitely the present. So it's how we understand our relationship to this thing we call the past. But it's actually about what we are doing in the moment, in the present. Mm. Because we are all, you know, I remember reading this beautiful quote from um, Claudia Rankin, who wrote a book called Citizen and American Lyric. And it's really talking about kind of race politics in America at the moment. She says, you know, the world is wrong. You can't put history behind you. You are its cupboard. Everything is buried in you. We are all, in fact, completely a product of this time before. And how much of that we can actually cope with bringing into the present is really also about how much we can imagine futures that aren't apocalyptic. You know, we have to be able to yeah, imagine futures. Uh, Donna Haraway writes about it um, as being in the thick present. So really how we manage to live in the thick present mm. without projecting ourselves into the future or into the past is actually the kind of process of learning how to not be capitulating between, you know, but actually being in the present, which is as much about the future and the past as it can be. Because we're only ever here. We're only ever going to be in the present. But we have to have that understanding of how we fit in this, you know, what Alexander Wahili might describe as a racialized assemblage or, you know, there's, there's this kind of idea of entanglements mm. that Karen Barad talks about which she talks about it in relation to quantum physics. She says, we, we can change, we can't erase the past, but we can change it. And that's through our understanding of it. We can, we can change our relationship to it. Our relationship to it. Yeah, but she also says that you can demonstrate that through quantum physics. So it's quite a profound lifting, a like a, a really a connection between quantum physics and cultural studies as discipline. So this is a kind of cheese like cutting edge thinker in what now is described as the post humanity. So it's this idea of post human. But for me, because she's a non indigenous academic, but for me, what's really profound in that is that Aboriginal people have always seen the world in these ways. That it's magical and it's scientific and it's it's big, big, huge stories that resonate particular truths through time. And some of those truths stand, stand the test of time. They're very, very strong sets of ideas that you can live by. But it's also about, mag it's a magical mm. world of fantastical stories of huge beyond beyond your understanding it's things that you can't possibly ever know but you can catch a glimmer of them and it helps you survive and how poor is your life if you never even get a glimmer yeah that's right mm. well it's it's kind of beyond the um this idea of humanity and this idea of what is a life. And I guess it's also about this idea of what is this idea of freedom that I think people need to interrogate. Mm. Because I think that this idea of freedom, of the, the whiteness, allows that you could know anything, you could travel anywhere. The world's your oyster. Yeah. I think that that's misguided. Mm. No one can ever escape suffering. And and also, we're not all going to be able to achieve, and nor should we want to know everything. It's, it, it's an impossibility, but it's also something that you shouldn't even strive to do. Mm. Some things are unknowable and we should accept the unknowability. Mm. But more than accept it, honour it. 
because it's some are really irrelevant. Mm. There's things that are important. You know, there's not an equal... It's not levelled out here of knowledge. Some knowledges are really important. Mm. And some knowledges are just not. And people need to choose what they're thinking about really carefully because we can cast any kinds of spells over ourselves and over the, the world of want and greed and all sorts of things, but it's actually not benefiting anyone. And also really thinking about sentient life other than our own. Mm. So the trees, like really, really old trees or, or, or animals and the kind of the planet, the rest of the planet, human life above all else is is also a really dangerous trajectory. You know, like I don't know what success is, but I do know that it's it's doomed for deep unhappiness. Mm. It's going against all of the incredible gifts that we have. Completely, it's doomed for suffering. And there's a sense of belonging too that you don't get when you have this view of everything is yours to take. It's you can't belong to anything when, no. you, when you're just taking. And there's a real arrogant perception associated with it mm. that also is about this sense this sense of yourself where I used to think about it a lot you know when you speak um you take up space and and sometimes it it means that other quieter voices can't be heard so and when you travel you displace a whole lot of things Mm -hmm. in the in the actual physical process of traveling and you might not know anything about where you're going but for me when you arrive in a place you know, for Nungas, there's that real sense of the spirits of country. So I always feel almost like a child, like a toddler or something when I arrive in a new place. If I haven't, if I don't understand where I am, so I don't know the old stories of that place, I don't know any of the elders or I haven't met them yet, and I haven't connected with people who've thought deeply about what that country is I I would never assume that I could make decisions about a place in that way like I wouldn't go somewhere and think oh I can just rule the roost here 